Well, I want to welcome you all back to our final afternoon session. And as the title suggests, expand your mind, getting a grasp on consciousness. This session should be mind-boggling, to coin a phrase. I mean, we've been talking about consciousness. We've been dancing around a, a little bit all uh, morning and a little bit of the afternoon. Uh, I once asked uh, half a dozen psychiatrists, psychologists, what consciousness was. They all defined it in their own way. They said there really is no definition at this point. So we'll try to answer that question and get some different viewpoints on it. Um, there are going to be short presentations, and at the end of each presentation, uh, we'll have a little bit of a sort of a different kind of panel discussion and open the uh, questions right to the audience. Our first speaker studies consciousness by altering it. Dr. Alexander Shulgin is a chemist and an author. He's also known as uh, Dr. X. The New York Times calls Dr. Shulgin a one-man psychopharmacological research sector. Um, Timothy Leary called him one of the century's most important scientists. Uh, by Shulgin's own account, he has created nearly 200 psychedelic compounds among them stimulants, depressants, aphrodisiacs, empathogens, convulsants, drugs that alter hearing, drugs that slow one's sense of time, reading from the New York Times article, drugs that speed it up, drugs that trigger violent outbursts, drugs that deaden emotion. In short, a veritable, veritable lexicon of tactile and emotional experience. Uh, many of these drugs, perhaps all of them, he has tested out on his, himself and his wife, um, with a few friends included at times. Um, and in addition to inventing the drug ecstasy, Dr. Shulgin is a consultant uh, very much in demand uh, for by an eclectic group of clients that include NASA, Bristol Laboratories, NIH, University of California, uh, for his view on how to, how to experience consciousness and uh, what consciousness is. Please welcome Dr. Alexander Shulgin. <laughs> Don't tell him I use his name Alexander. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and a great honor to be here. Uh, I'm not a great lover of micro, was it micro point? Uh, magic PowerPoint, PowerPoint. Had I known that you were going to have a PowerPoint availability here, I probably would not have used it anyway, because every time I've tried using it, about 30% of the time at least, it fails, it falls apart somehow, it never quite gets to where I want to go. So I, I, rather than put a lot of chemical structures which would be boring to about 80% of the audience and fascinating to the other 20%, I suspect. Uh, I'll just use my hands and wave my hands as is appropriate. Uh, I mean, molecules obviously are, you know, rings and chains and nitrogens, and there's no problem about that at all. Um, my interest in the area, actually, this is, this is a, a, a nice opportunity. I spent a couple of years of my life upriver, uh, some, oh, 60 or so years ago, more than that, at Harvard, where I uh, had the unfortunate pleasure of having a national scholarship, which got me in there free. And uh, I found that everyone else had parents who had enough money to get them in there, having paid their way. And I could find very little rapport with the masses of freshmen that were around me. So I found it much more pleasurable to go in the Navy and spend three years in the Atlantic, in the anti-submarine patrol, which actually gave me a very nice beginning on chemistry in that one of the um, books I had with me was a book by Paul Carr, a Swiss chemist, written about 1938 or 1940. And it was a complete over, over uh, statement, complete statement of the uh, subtleties and the complexities of organic chemistry. And when you're spending three years uh, in the Atlantic waiting for submarines, you have a lot of time spare. And I not only read the book, but substantially understood it. And uh, it was a very, very great pleasure to get out of the Navy and back into the university at Berkeley, where I took organic chemistry as my major. And uh, the greatest compliment I had was from a, a fellow by the name of Kason, uh, who was a lecturer there, at, uh, or professor at chemistry. And uh, he said, by the way, he met him in the hall during, the, I guess, the second year of organic chemistry. Um, we're having a, a midterm this coming Tuesday, and you can take it if you want to which I thought was quite a compliment because I was, uh, the average on the first midterm was something like 
62 points out of 100, and I had 100 percent. And he didn't know exactly why. I mean, I, I, could, I could answer the questions without any problem, because they were all in Paul Carr's book, and I had memorized the book. Ah, no, that's, I think, honest, but <laughs> not very much. Anyway, uh, that, uh, after that, I got into um, my uh, AB in chemistry at Berkeley, a PhD in biochemistry at Berkeley. Got involved in a little laboratory. There are five of us called BioRad Laboratory. That's now a multi-million dollar operation. Had I stayed with them, I would have been a very, very rich millionaire with ulcers at this point. And I'm very glad I just I split the scene when there's still only five of us present. Did a little radioactive synthesis in their, in their name. Uh, did some postdoctorate work at Berkeley. Uh, went to Dow Chemical Company, the Dow Chemical Company, out with a branch of it there in Pittsburgh, in, near, near, the, near the Bay Area in, in California. And um, it's there that I really got initiated into what turned out to be a very important change in my life. I had my first experience with uh, mescaline, about 1960, it's a, 1950, 1960, about 45 years ago. Uh, 400 milligrams of the, of the sulfate and had a good babysitter. And I had explored a great deal around various psychoactive drugs. This is supposed to be an erotic thing. That is supposed to be an amnesia thing. Each of these had their own little name. I had heard about mescaline, had never tried it. And that one day, that eight or 10 hour experience, really changed uh, my life for the next uh, half century. I was totally fascinated with a drug that could get in there, allow you to see things you would not normally see, and yet you knew to be valid. I have a reasonably limited uh, knowledge of colors. Suddenly I saw colors that I had never really appreciated before. I could look at a flower and observe the beauty of a flower. Could not open the flower, could not touch it, but I observed the beauty of a flower. I had memories from childhood that I knew were valid, but I had not thought of them for years. It was a very, very delightful uh, experience, but mainly what uh, uh, impressed me most thoroughly is that uh, that experience was clearly not due, the contents of that experience were not in that 400 milligrams of the drug. The drug, what it did, it catalyzed my mind. It got my mind back into that particular area. So I looked upon these materials as being catalytic, not productive. They do not do what occurs. They allow you to express what is in you that you had not had the ability to get to and express uh, yourself without, without the help of a, of a material. So this really caught my fancy and I said if, if this little 400 milligrams of something could be a, a, an effective catalyst to, relieve, to re reveal back to me what I had done, what I had seen and uh, such, there is a great potential here for, uh, for medical use. And that caught me with my little knowledge of chemistry and my intense curiosity as what was going on upstairs in my head as it was revealed by this masculine experience, I really went into uh, a, a true new direction of chemistry. And here is where I guess I kind of have to wave hands. Um, mescaline is a ring with three methoxy groups out here. Don't worry what a methoxy group is. Someone near you will probably explain it later. A carbon, carbon, and a nitrogen, a very simple molecule. Uh, and I said, you know, if this molecule can be this effective, of what other kind of effects could be gotten by similar materials? So the first thing I did was stick a methyl group on down here. So now I now have an amphetamine compound and took it very cautiously. We're talking a lot today already about experiments with, with mice and with rats and with um, various animals. In my own case, I, the only animal I used was, was the human animal. I presume this is now a little awkward because of the various uh, national and federal regulations have come in, but uh, I find that still the human, human animal is the only one that is really effective in evaluating and comparing these various psychedelic materials, and, I, and, and the work I do is still involved in that direction. Um, here's a material that is identical with mescaline, I call it trimethoxyamphetamine, TMA, and, uh, and my golly, it was uh, about twice as potent and totally different in its action. With the mescaline, I had this, this love and sensitivity to a flower that was on my coffee table where I was living. And under the TMA experience, uh, I got very curious about it and tore it apart to see what was inside. Complete change of, of attitude toward, toward something of, of precious beauty. 